This is White Plains Week, the weekly roundup of White Plains, Westchester, and world news with John Bailey, editor and publisher of the daily internet newspaper, White Plains Citizen Net Reporter, WPCNR.com. Jim Benneroff, editor and publisher of SuburbanStreet.com and WhitePlains.com. And me, Peter Katz, formerly with NBC, ABC News, and stations from Boston to Los Angeles. White Plains Week, what's happening? Who are the newsmakers? What's in store for the future? The views and opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the participants. White Plains Week is presented on Optimum Cable Channel 76, Verizon Fios Channel 45, and on the internet at whiteplainsweek.com, youtube.com, and wpcommunitymedia.org. Now, White Plains Week. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. White Plains, Westchester and the world. John Bailey, White Plains Week with Jim Benneroff, the uh, Dean of Journalism in the City of White Plains, and Peter Katz, the anchor for all seasons. And first off, we want to get some official business out of the way. Today marks the 18th anniversary of White Plains Week going on the air. And here's a picture of the way it looked over the years. Coming up. Now, there on the left is Alex Filipides, myself, and Jim when we started White Plains Week about 18 years ago. And over on the right, Peter Katz joined the show in 2007 on the old set, Peter. And on the, on the lower right is what we looked like last week, which were 17 years on the air. And uh, I want to thank Jim for working show with me many <laughs> years ago and putting up with the show all these years. And Peter, thank you for joining the show in 2007 and carrying and, on the tradition. And putting up with you for all of these years. Please. Yeah, that's difficult. Just ask my <laughs> wife, please. Right. And right now, it's time for the headlines. And here are the headlines for this week. City will vote on a red light camera ordinance. Intersection locations not determined yet might be in place by summer. Number of flu cases seen by doctors across state increases 200 percent. County Executive George Latimer and Commissioner of Health urge public get a flu shot. Mr. Latimer gets his shot on television. City sales tax is up 13 percent in six months after very strong October, November, December business. White Plains is on target to make last year's sales tax handle and more. White Plains man is charged with grand larceny for allegedly cheating two women in White Plains and Rye Brook. Assistant Attorney General warns seniors, your best defense against a phone scam is to not answer numbers that you do not recognize and never provide information to a caller unless you initiate a call. We will have a State of Trump report from Peter Katz and Brian and Beth Wallach and Lifting Up Westchester are selected as the honorees of the Friendly Gathering, March 18th fundraiser for the RDC Center for Counseling and Human Development. Thanks, Jim, and right away to the White Plains Week Rollo Newsreel March of Time, and the first shot is the shocker of the week, and that's the red light cameras, which had a public um, meeting on it uh, Monday, and both of you guys went. Tell us about it. Well, John, one of the most striking things about the city moving now to install red light cameras at up to a dozen intersections is the lack of public debate we've had on the subject in City Hall. I first heard that the idea had been rejected by the city as nonsensical way back during the Delfino administration. Now, we're told that the first word now that some council members had that they'd actually have to vote on red light cameras at the meeting this coming Monday was when red light cameras appeared as a one-line item 
in the agenda for a January 29th special meeting, which was put out just a few hours ahead of that meeting. When Karen Pasquale of the mayor's office describes to the Common Council the team that took up the issue, note the absence of the Common Council and general public from that team. The city did put together a project team um, that included the Public Safety Department, the Law Department, Department of Public Works, Parking Department, and the Traffic Department in the Mayor's Office. Um, an RFP for a vendor was developed and released in February 2016. Um, the city received five responses to that RFP. Uh, the team had reviewed the responses. We ultimately decided to interview three out of the five respondents. And um, based on this, there was a lot of back and forth discussions, follow up questions by email, things of that nature. Based on this, the team is recommending um, the respondent American Traffic Solutions. Uh, my name is Charlie Calari. I'm the Vice President for the region. We are the largest provider of this technology uh, in the market. And as you might imagine, the market kind of started uh, back in the 90s with only red light camera sensors. Uh, now through you know, the evolutionary stage of, of uh, state-of-the-art technology, we've miniaturized uh, the footprint. It's a lot small and it's a lot dedicated to, to di different types of technology. So our, sensors, our sensors, sensors can capture speed, can capture red lights, and obviously in New York City we're doing uh, dedicated bus, bus routes as well. So again, the kind of technology is, uh, is, is evolving very, very nicely. We have more than 650 clients across the country. And again, we have the largest footprint, so more than 400 camera systems. We've been, uh, New York City, as you might imagine, is the largest program in the country. Here in Westchester, we have uh, uh, Yonkers that we've been managing uh, since the inception of the program, as well as uh, uh, Mount Vernon, and uh, we hope to have White Plains, of course. So we captured two still shots. The A shot captures the vehicle co completely behind the stop bar, all four tires behind the stop bar, and the light has turned red. So. Uh, some of the misnomer of the technology is that we're firing on yellow. Absolutely not. The light has to be red, and all four tires have to be completely behind the stop bar before we capture the A shot, which is the rear of the license plate. Then, we, then through the timing of the sensors, the, the vehicle travels through the middle of the intersection, where again we're able to capture the second shot unobstructed from traffic, and we can zoom in on the license plate and capture the, the DMV tanks nicely. As an additional public safety aspect, we're capturing a 12-second video which provides the whole scene of the, of the image, kind of gives you an impression as to ha, ha, uh, what has occurred at the location. So, um, uh, for example, a vehicle getting pushed into the intersection by a, another vehicle or a police officer telling them to go through. These are all the various nuances of the program that through the business rules will be regulated. But again, the 12-second video kind of captures the scene uh, very, very nicely. Now, one thing that no one really is talking about is what happens to all of this data that's been captured very, very nicely. Um, how yeah. long is it retained? Who has access okay, to it? Okay, that was brought up uh, and, at the meeting. Uh, and uh, what did they say then? Well, I think they said um, that it's kept, I'm not 100% sure, there was an awful lot of detail that was given out, and I can't remember every single detail, but I think they said it was kept for 30 days, um, except where there was a violation, I think that was kept more permanently. Uh, but that, wa that subject was brought up. And That's why it's hard to talk about it without having listened to the whole presentation. I don't know that it's the best idea to do it. What I observed from the presentation that it sounded reasonably fair. Now, you have a lot of statistics. I don't know how up to date those statistics are. And I think if you actually interviewed the two guys that made the presentation, you could get a lot of these questions answered. They rely on um statistics prepared by an insurance institute, uh, which is funded by the insurance industry. Uh, there are two real types uh, of uh, serious accidents which occur at, at intersections. Uh, T-bone accidents where, where cars hit at right angles 
and rear end accidents. Uh, the, uh, the head on collisions are, are, are fairly rare. The more, more common are the are rear end actually. Uh, now it turns out that the T-bone accidents apparently can be reduced through the use of red light cameras. There's, there appears to be some data to support that. Uh, however, the trade-off is that the data also supports rear-end accidents increasing dramatically uh, as a result. Uh, from the standpoint of insurance companies, however, the T-bone accidents are the more serious, are the more expensive to pay off on, uh, and therefore, if T-bone accidents can be reduced, even at the expense of increasing rear-end accidents, the insurance companies make out better. Uh, and so some will, will suggest that using statistics prepared by the Insurance Institute for uh, highway safety uh, really does not give you a valid picture of what's going on in the field and that what really should be looked at is material prepared by the Institute of Traffic Engineers uh, and the Federal Highway Safety Traffic Administration. Um, there also have been questions raised about some of the numbers in that where they are showing uh, reductions in not only in T-bone accidents but in rear end collisions. Uh, they're monkeying around a little bit by redefining what constitutes an intersection. Mm -hmm. uh, the Federal Highway Traffic Safety Administration generally uh, says that an intersection goes back 135 feet. Um, on some of the insurance data that I have seen, uh, they say an intersection only goes back 30 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have things taking place in uh, that last 100 feet, which is not measured by um, insurance data, uh, then Slamming uh, on the brakes. things could be, Slamming. a lot of things could be going on uh, yeah. in the way of, of accident numbers that just don't get yeah. reported. Uh, it seems that uh, if you look globally uh, at this, and, and again, s statistics are hard to come by. Uh, there's, there's plenty of old data. There's very, very little um, so far 2017 data available. Uh, what appears to be the case is that, yes, there has been some reduction in the T-bone, the more serious and expensive kinds of accidents. The trade-off is a dramatic increase in rear-end accidents. For instance, um, on Long Island, um, both in Nassau and Suffolk, uh, where there were red light cameras put in, uh, they were showing about a 20% increase in rear-end accidents. And this was uh, used um, as, a, uh, as a major arguing point uh, from people trying to get rid of them. Um. Uh, now, if safety is, is, the, is a real concern here, uh, and, th and there's no interest in using this as a revenue generating source for a municipality, um, what does exist is, is a clear indication that the safety of intersections can be enhanced by making structural changes at intersections and also by increasing the length of the yellow light. In fact, Peter, I drove through White Plains yesterday just sort of stopped watching how long yellows last up along uh, Merrick Avenue, the main drag, and uh, it's about two point two and a half seconds when you figure if there's the reaction time to press the, the stopwatch. So well, maybe a maximum of three or, seconds. Or to hit the brake. Yes, right. Um, and that's, that's too short. There's, there's one comment I have to make about rear end accidents. First of all, if anybody rear ends you, okay, they are automatically at fault. You have to leave a certain amount of space between the car and front, and this is just general driving. Mm -hmm. And you're always at fault if you rear end somebody. Because Definitely. what is happening is either those people are traveling too close or this uh, is a habit or that going too fast. Has gotten into over the years. Yes, generally the, the rule of so, thumb should be that, that for every 10 miles of speed you allow one car length between you and the, and the car. And I guarantee you. you could prove that they aren't doing that when they have those rear end accidents. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's possible, however, um, 
there is re human reaction time. It takes time. Uh, I know in studies that that have been done r related to aviation, uh, it's been shown that it can take a pilot to react to a sudden emergency, like a sudden decompression, uh, sometimes as much as two and a half seconds. Uh, in the case, uh, if you were to apply that to driving in White Plains, uh, where you have well, a yellow light that only well, lasts you two and a half seconds, something. you have no, no room and, for and, error. And I'm a keen observer of this because of my own age. Yeah. You've got a lot of people in my age group, let's say 65 to 75 years old. And I watch changes when I drive with these people as to who has the reaction ability. And that's one of the reasons that I would say we ought to try this red light thing because there are too many people, period, out there driving. And if you don't put the age statistics with the accidents, I don't think it's a particularly good example right. either. Well, it, I, you know, I, as, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the, the data is hard to come by, uh, and unfortunately, uh, there are ways to manipulate data to, to get the desired uh, outcome. Absolutely. Uh, I so, you know, when that. you have someone, I'm, I'm not making an allegation here, but just typically when you have someone standing up, you know, making a sales pitch, they're going to use data which is favorable to whatever it is uh, they're selling. Uh, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's up to, or should have been up to the city uh, with this team that it put together uh, when it looked at data to do original research uh, and to, to come up with whatever uh, various data is, is available out there. And, and again, we noticed, uh, or I noticed, the absence uh, of representation, uh, certainly of the, of the public and certainly of the Common Council. Yeah. Uh, and uh, from what we can tell now, we're recording this on Friday, the Council vote is, would be on Monday. Um, there's a, a strong possibility that this is going to be on the consent agenda and is, going, is. To, and is going to Item go through 83. without uh, mm -hmm. uh, any kind of uh, public hearing. Right. And looking forward, if we have the slide of my list, please. and. Uh, and those are the things that um, they have to look at. They have to have a right on red policy. The police needed to sort it out. Two and a half seconds to stop. Do you uh, slam on the brakes or take the ticket? If you obey the speed limit of 25, it gives you more chance. Look at the light, um, the light you're approaching, the light beyond the light you're approaching to figure out if you have to stop. Timers not approved by New York State found that drivers speed up if you, t you have a timing device and they don't allow it. And the cost, $3,750 per month for one camera and the way I look at it, they could make as much of nine as a $900,000 if half, if no, three quarters of those uh, 18,000 violations are red lights. But that, we don't know but that's that But they do yet. not. I, the point is, there is no commission on the amount of tickets that they give out. 2,000 tickets, they get no more than their fixed fee for operating the camera. That's it. They do not Right. They don't share in the, That's a very important point. Right. But meanwhile, speaking of points, you need to get your flu shots. And George Latimer, the county executive, had his flu shot this week, and he told why today to do something that every Westchester resident should do. And I'm here today because, like many Westchester residents, I have been lazy and stupid in not doing it already. And that is getting a flu shot to give myself the best possible protection in what is a very uh, intense flu season. Uh, Dr. Shalina Amra, who is our uh, Commissioner of Public Health, will discuss a little bit of the backdrop of this. But uh, even as a layman, I know that uh, a flu shot will give me the best possible protection against what's happening out there. And, and this applies really to everybody in the family. Now, I'm 64 years of age, so those who are a little bit older uh, are even more vulnerable. Those, obviously, at the other end of the spectrum are younger. Uh, but there is an opportunity for you to protect yourself and your family by making sure you do the same thing that I'm about to do, which is get a flu shot. Uh, the flu vaccines are offered through the uh, Westchester County Department of Health and our various clinics, on, uh, whether White Plains, Yonkers, Dr. Amber will outline that uh, in a second. Uh, this is the greatest uh, time of the season to be worried about the flu. 
uh, because as I'm told, this is a very uh, intense flu season. It may last a little longer than has been expected in the past. So even though we're having this conversation in January, it is still a timely thing to do, and we should do it. I understand that we've uh, given out 1,400 flu shots at this point, uh, and that's a significant amount, but there are almost a million people in Westchester County. So the, uh, uh, the liability here is tremendous for those of us who should do it. There are few vaccines offered at supermarkets, at your local doctor's offices, but again, you can make an appointment at White Plains or Yonkers with the County Department of Health and get a flu shot through here. If you'd like more information, you can go on our website at www.westchestergov backslash health, dot com backslash health to get more information. And if you want, call the health department at 914-995-5800, 995-5800 to schedule a free flu shot. And now, Peter, some Trumpism on the state of Trump. Well, uh, it looks as if uh, President Trump has decided to throw the FBI director. He appointed Christopher Wray under the bus and he is not going to block the release of this memo drafted by Republican Congressman Devin Nunez's staff and the White House staff, which contains falsehoods about how the FBI got a FISA warrant to wiretap Carter Page before he was a Trump campaign aide, and the wiretapping continued after he joined the Trump campaign, and that the Russians had been recruiting Page as a spy even before he joined the Trump campaign. This memo attacks Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, who is the one appointed, who appointed Special Counsel Robert Mueller. And um, Mueller apparently is homing in on Trump and his family for interference with the election, with the Russians, obstruction of justice, and money laundering. And it's believed that Trump wants an excuse to fire Rosenstein, so then he can put in someone who will fire Mueller, kind of the Saturday Night Massacre in slow motion. An association of FBI agents put out a statement supporting Ray. Ray said it would be reckless to release this trumped up memo. Trump's closest and loyalist advisor, who is not a family member, Hope Hicks, the White House communications director, told Trump that incriminating emails to and from Donald Jr. in which he was arranging to meet the Russians to get dirt on Hillary Clinton could disappear. There was a third person on that conference call, the former spokesman for Trump's personal lawyers, Mark Corallo. Corallo quit the Trump legal team after hearing Trump and Hicks discuss the emails and hearing her say, and this is a quote, they will never get out. Carrillo said that he couldn't take a chance on aiding and abetting in obstruction of justice, and so he quit the Trump legal team. Lying Donald told another whopper this one about his State of the Union speech this week. He said more people watched his speech on TV than any other State of the Union in, in history. Well, the Nielsen ratings show that 45.6 million people watched. That's actually lower than Barack Obama's 48 million, George W. Bush's 51.7 million, and Bill Clinton's 66.9 million. The State of the Union contained numerous lies, half-truths, and flip-flops on positions. It lasted one hour, 20 minutes, about as long as the December 10th, 1940 speech by Adolf Hitler at the Rheinmetall Borsig Works factory, where Hitler boasted about all the jobs he was creating in Germany. The Washington Post reports that Trump's Secretary of Housing, Ben Carson, is under investigation for allegedly arranging a no-bid government contract worth about a half million dollars to go to a consulting company named Meridian, whose chief executive officer is Merlin Carson, the wife of his son, Ben Carson Jr. Ben Jr. is on the company's board of directors. Secretary Carson apparently also has been involving his son in HUD's activities. The Washington Post obtained a memo in which Carson was warned shortly after taking office not to involve his family in government business. Trump appointee Dr. Brenda Fitzgerald has resigned as head of the Centers for Disease Control. Questions were raised about her judgment and conflicts of interest. Her financial entanglements meant she had to recuse herself. 
from par participating in her agency's work, such as on major issues as the opioid crisis, cancer detection, and the flu epidemic. Maybe George Latimer could have gotten her a flu shot. Uh, it certainly would be in, in order, and that's a great comparison to the, to the Hitler speech, Peter. To Peter. Isn't that interesting? Thanks for <laughs> digging that out. It sounded very Hitler-esque. And um, right now, though, there's a new building slated for Chester. And you oh, have some you, talk you about that. I think so. Well, actually, that was up at the uh, Common Council special meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, Keeler Markwood Group has proposed building a medical office building at 6 and 8 Chester Avenue in downtown. Two multi-story houses, which had been converted into law offices, would be torn down for it. The principals of Keeler Markwood are... Sam Dickinson and Matthew Tritt. Plans to develop a new medical office building were presented to the White Plains Common Council at a special meeting January 29th. The site is downtown at 6 and 8 Chester Avenue. Council members were concerned about visual impact. Some suggested solar electric panels go on the roof. The developer's attorney is William Null. We'll certainly look into that. You know, the, the, one of the things that happens with medical office buildings is they have a very high power requirement. So it, it's unlikely that it could be fully done, but we'll look and see what can be done. The sure. the building be and as far as the, the fencing goes, um, I think the rendering didn't show the, the landscaping that's shown on yeah. this. So it's just part of integrating the entire design. And we're sensitive to the, the street uh, appearance of, of the building. We'll work with the city on that. A question was raised whether the market will absorb additional office space. I, I, I'm, I'm Sam Dickinson. I'm one of the owners of the property. And I, actually, Matt and I were, were talking about this um, uh, just recently, where there was a, a panel by some of the biggest brokers that operate in the city. And by their estimates, that vacancy could actually be uh, sucked up within the next one, two, three years. So that's the first part of our consideration. The second part is that in terms of just medical office stock, in that perimeter, uh, perimeter to the hospital, everything is kind of vintage 50s, 60s, 70s. So we, we think we're kind of filling a niche here for somebody that wants a little more updated, modern, class A type space. So while there is some vacancy in the city, I think part of our uh, uh, theory about why there's a need here is that people want a different type of space. Um, the other thing I'll just add while I have your attention is that I, I'm uh, a White Plains resident. So hearing all this feedback is actually really helpful and the last thing I want is for my friends and neighbors and family to drive by and say what is this monstrosity so <laughs> fu fully taking all that feedback on board uh, I want to have something here and, and Matt's a Westchester resident as well um, I have solar panels on my house <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I think we want this to be something that we can take pride in people are going to drive by and say hey this improved the neighborhood and it's really a great addition to the city so um, we welcome any additional feedback that you have as well. And one more note, the Friendly, yeah, friendly Gathering. And there it is, Beth, uh, Beth Wallach and Brian Wallach will that's, be honored. That's an annual event up Westchester. Uh, in White Plains. Yeah, right, and uh, that's all the time we have this evening. John Bailey, Peter Katz, Jim Benaroff. Good night for White Plains Week. This has been White Plains Week news and commentary about White Plains, Westchester, and the world. The views and opinions expressed on this program were solely those of the participants. White Plains Week, produced by White Plains Citizen Net Reporter and presented on Optimum Cable Channel 76 and Verizon Fios Channel 45. You may view White Plains Week anytime on the internet at whiteplainsweek.com, youtube.com, and wpcommunitymedia.org. For White Plains Week, this is Peter Katz speaking.